there and not how many of you can look at it and say, yes, I have been there. Anybody can look at that and say, yes, I have been there. Ray is raising his hand. He says he has been there. I think maybe Pastor Darrell has been there. I think maybe Sue Katrina has been there. Uh, that is Ephesus. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, if you take a look, there's 127 pillars, and the pillars held up the, the ceiling to the Temple of Diana. Uh, the 127 pillars was, each one was donated by a different king, all in pure marble. The city is so bright in the Old Town section of Ephesus that if you go there during the middle of the day, they recommend that you wear sunglasses because it is actually blinding. Uh, the entire city, the streets, the gutters, the bathrooms, uh, everything was pure marble, white marble. Now, how many of us would say, what a waste? Would anybody say that? What a waste to build an entire city and have it all be of the most precious. But what's heaven going to be like? Heaven will make Ephesus you know, just look like it was nothing to say in comparison. Now, I hope you have your Bible with you today. Uh, we are actually going to finish up Acts chapter 18, I think. Now, I say I think because I'm trying real hard to, uh, to get everything in that I believe that we need to see. And so with that in mind, if you have your Bible, let's go to Acts chapter 18. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 22. When Paul landed at Caesarea, your Bible might say when he, but I want to make sure we all remember who we're talking about. When Paul landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and he went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to another throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in his spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greeted with, uh, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Let's pray again. Father, as we look at this passage and as we think about the Christ, as we think about the gospel, as we think about the second trip coming to an end and the third trip starting off so quickly, Lord, help us to think that the gospel is so real, it's alive, and life can change in a hurry. We could be thinking that our mom is going to move here from Colorado and discover that before I can even get there, they could be in glory. And so, Lord, uh, help us to see the urgency of the hour with the, the power of the message if it's the complete gospel. And we pray this in Jesus. Well, we are in Acts chapter 18, uh, and we're going to talk today about the gospel. Now, the gospel must be the gospel. Now, you know, we're not necessarily an amen church, but how many of us know what the word amen means? How many of us know what it means? It means what? It means, so be it, I agree in thought, and I will now agree in behavior. You see, anybody who says amen just because they heard something they liked, that's it. Yeah. You can just say yeah. You can say, whoo, good. You can say amen, but not amen. Because if all it is is a verbal uh, expression of a thought that tickled your spirit, that's not amen. The biblical amen means I agree with what you are saying. And I will do what we are in agreement with. It was twofold. An amen always was a noun verb, just like faith. A thought that demanded an action. And so now, when I say amen, you might, ooh, I know I agree with him, but I don't know if I'm ready 
ready to do that. Okay, so we'll be careful about the church is healthy. Now, the church is a healthy church. Some of you might say, I've seen this before. The church is a healthy church if it's a gospel-saturated church. Has anybody heard that before? The church is a healthy church if it knows the gospel. The church is a healthy church if it desires to hear the gospel over and over again, even if it means preaching the gospel to yourself. The church is a healthy church if it desires to tell those outside, bring your neighbor. Uh, the church is a healthy church if it's saturated with the gospel. How many of you like pancakes? With just maybe one drop of syrup on it. I want my pancake saturated. Now, I don't eat pancakes anymore, but when I did, no bananas, I wanted them saturated with syrup. Because it sucks it all up by the time you get to your pancake, where did all the syrup go? Okay, I, I want the gospel saturated to the point that it doesn't dry up. I want to know the gospel. There's an old, old song that says, I love to tell the story. Anybody remember that? And it says, I love to tell it over and over again because those who know it best love to hear it again the most. I think sometimes we're losing our desire to hear the gospel over and over again. It needs to be the center or how I order my life. Do I order my life around the gospel? So if you were to come into church here, you would say today, well, I think I would like to have a healthy dose or a healthy helping of the gospel. Maybe with a little bit of discipleship, a little bit of prayer, a little bit of singing, but main course is going to be the gospel. Now, has anybody heard any of this kind of teaching recently in class? I hope you have, or you probably slept through a class, or, or you didn't read that particular chapter. Uh, let's see how healthy the church of Ephesus was. Because what is the, the sign of a healthy church member? What is the sign of a healthy church? They are saturated in the gospel. They desire to hear the gospel. They desire to tell the gospel. They order their life around the gospel. And that's how we decide whether or not I am, whether we are a healthy church. Paul leaves Caesarea. Take a look back again, verse number 22. Paul leaves Caesarea, and it says, and he went up to Jerusalem. You might say, no, 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 no. My Bible does not say Jerusalem. Now, there are a couple of words in there that always are used when referring to Jerusalem, so they didn't have to use the word. Uh, anybody say, can say something like, I'm going to go to mom's house. And you know exactly where mom's house is, even though you don't say the address. I'm going to go build, visit the city. And, and there's a difference between a city and the city. Now, I don't know what the city is to you, but I know this. That if you were to use the word on the bus and cate bay, that is to go way up and to go way down. And any time they were going way up, it was always up that long road to Jerusalem and down that long road. So it has nothing to do with north and south. It has everything to do with elevation. So when he says, and he went up, the word there is on the bus. So everybody knows that he went up to Jerusalem. Now how do we know that he was really going there? Didn't he get his hair cut last week? And what was he going to do with the hair that was cut according to Numbers 21? He was supposed to take that hair and take it to the mother church. Where would be the mother church? Jerusalem, and then give it to the priest. Remember, the priest, he was going to go to the synagogue with it. Go to the priest, and then they were going to burn up his hair as a peace offering unto the Lord. And so we know that he was on his way. So he would not just deviate and go straight to Antioch. He had to, first of all, fulfill his vow. And what did we talk about fulfilling vows last week? It is better not to make a vow and to make a vow and not keep it. And so Paul keeps his vow, shaves his head. I know several of you came up to me last week and said, I didn't know that men in the Bible time regularly cut their hair. The only people who let their hair grow long and their beard grow long was the Nazarites or the people working in an area where they didn't have regular water. But when they came to town, they had a regular haircut and they would trim up their beard. Many of them shaved it off completely every time. Uh, anybody ever see the movies? And, and they, when they see the movies, uh, how many in the movies, they always show the people with long hair, completely going crazy, big beard. But when you look at the Romans, they're completely shaved and nice haircut. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, that's how people look, the regular people do. Even Peter, even Andrew, <coughs> even James, and even John, when they're out fishing, 
But when it was time for them to go to, they would clean up to go to church, they would cut their hair. I'm not going to say cut it all the way down. But the only time they shaved it off was what? To show that they had completed their Nazarite vow. And the only time they let it grow and continue to grow was to show what? That they had taken a nausea. And a nausea can either be a man or a woman for a length of time upon completion. Shaved the head. Why? Shaved head would stick out like a sore thumb. And they would be able to say, you completed your vow. That would give you an opportunity to be a living object lesson. For the people around. And he says he makes his way up to Antioch, but he goes and he greeted. Now it doesn't just say to eklon, which means that how many of us know that the Greek word for the church is ekklesia? And to eklon would be a church, but it says he ekklesia, meaning the church. So he went up and visited, we would do it this way, he ekklesia. Because what would that mean? The mother church of all Christianity, and it existed where? In Jerusalem. And so he makes his way to Jerusalem, and then he makes his way down. Now notice he goes down to Antioch. And some people would say, see, the Bible is so ge geographically incorrect. You've got to go north. Now let's not forget, is the Bible worried about north and south, or is it caring more about elevation? And so he says, I've got to go down the hill to get to Syria, because it was 300 miles north. Now, I want you to notice something. We get to verse number 23, and immediately the second missionary trip comes to an end. And after spending some time there, he departed, and immediately the third trip begins. That's your turnaround for the second missionary trip and the third missionary trip. So he goes down, spends some time, and he leaves. That is the entire transition between the two. And he goes to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is 1,500 miles west. And as he is going, he stops and he strengthens the disciples. And he doesn't just strengthen, but he's strength strengthening all the disciples. There is something special when, when the, a founding pastor comes back that everybody remembered. Uh, there is something special. They do a thing in the South called Homecoming Sunday. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Homecoming Sunday is when uh, everybody gets together and celebrates the birth of the church. Uh, the church that I pastored in Georgia uh, began in 1861. Anybody know what was going on in Georgia in 1861? Anybody know? Yes, there's a little history. 20 miles south, 20 miles south of where this church was being built, Sherman was burning everything in sight. 20 miles north of where this church, uh, church was being built, McPherson was burning everything in sight. And in this little spot called Lost Mountain, pretty appropriately named, so lost that even the, the Yankee troops didn't even bother going over there. We went up into the attic. There was still raw timber in the attic. I'm not talking about two-by-fours. I'm talking about sticks cut down straight off the tree like a log cabin. And that was the original in the original chapel when we went up to do a remodel. It was something, every year we'd invite somebody to come back and speak, and every year it was an incredible experience because we all got excited and we were all strengthened. It was incredible. In fact, we may try that here. As we think about next year when we have to celebrate the, now we just turned 50, remember a couple of years ago, as a church? Uh, so we're still pretty young as far as church grows in America. But why not celebrate every year the year that we were founded, the day that we were founded? That would strengthen us. I don't know exactly what he did, but he strengthened them. Now I want you to notice the beginning of verse number 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, sometime after Paul left Ephesus and went back to Jerusalem and to Antioch, and then before he comes back in Acts chapter 19, Apollos shows up. Enter Apollos. Now, Apollos is an incredible person in the Bible. Let's just take a look at what it says about him. It says that he comes from Alexandria. Alexandria has the best library in the world <coughs> up until that time and way beyond. So he had access to all of this literature, the Hammurabi codes, everything that was in there. Anybody ever see the National Treasure? And they go, oh, 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 look at all this stuff. Could you imagine having lived there 
I don't know about you, but there is something special about going into a library for me. And especially if it's like a national library. Anybody ever been into the National Library of Congress? And you walk in and you just, the amount of, of literature that is there, but not just the papers, but what represents the writing of those papers, the people that wrote, the reason that they wrote, the things that they wrote. Uh, it, at Alexandria, he had everything at his, uh, at his hands, and he took charge of it. It says here that he was a native of Alexandria, and he came to Ephesus, and he was an anerlogio. Now, that means an eloquent man. Uh, the phrase means when he spoke, people just stopped speaking. Uh, have you ever talked to someone and you could tell that they were really not listening, they were just waiting for you to catch a breath so they could say something back? They were already, they weren't even thinking about what you were saying. They were already coming up with a rebuttal. <laughs> and as soon as you stopped talking, and what about? And they were just ready to argue. This phrase here, on the air do deal, literally means that when he spoke, it just went, uh, took your breath away, took your thoughts away, and completely encompassed you in what they were saying, how they were saying, the words they, they were using, the expressions, maybe even the illustrations. It says that he was an eloquent man. And then it says that he was competent in the scriptures. Now, the word for competent is a strange word in the Greek. It's this word, in me. Now, how many of us remember what Jesus is name for himself, or his name for God is. I.e., Ami. This is how I exist. The word Ami means exist. And so if we were to read this directly out of the Greek, it would say, he existed in the graphes. He lived in the scriptures. Now let's not forget, the scriptures were what at the time of Apollos? The Old Testament. So he could prove that Jesus was the Messiah using nothing but the graphe. You want to have an interesting, fun time? Take nothing but the Old Testament and write out a complete thesis on how Jesus is the one and only Messiah using nothing but the Old Testament. One time Margaret was on an airplane and a person sat down next to her, and I don't know exactly how the conversation started, but uh, he was a liberal Jew. And she wanted to talk to him about saving faith in Christ. But the only way to do it, even for a liberal Jew, would be to talk what? The Old Testament. Just. And, and, and let's not forget that the Hebraic people does not call it the Old Testament. It's the Torah. Because there is no New Testament. Yeah. So it's not old. It's what? It's the word. It is the graphics. It is the scripture. And, and so he used the scriptures, and it says here, and being fervent in spirit. Now, how many of you fervent in spirit there in verse number 25 would expect the word spirit, pneumos, to have a capital S? Wouldn't you expect that, that he was fervent in the, the Holy Spirit? But he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It says he was fervent in his spirit. He was, he was saturated with what he knew about Jesus. And he was so saturated, he couldn't wait to share it with anyone and everyone to such a way that they were spellbound by the way in which he spoke about what he knew about Jesus. He was fervent in his spirit when he spoke. Have you ever seen somebody and they were talking about something and you could tell that they really knew what they were talking about but they weren't excited about it? You know, there are a lot of things that I have a little bit of knowledge on. I mean, there are a plethora of things that I have a little bit of knowledge on. And there are some things that I have a little bit of knowledge on that I'm not all that excited about. Uh, I am still trying to learn how to cook, but not excited about it. <laughs> We're going to try some more fish today, not excited about it. Um, and, and so there are some things that I can talk about, but I'm not excited about it. But when I'm not excited about it, what do the recipients of my conversation get? They get not excited about it, too, unless they are saturated in it. Have you ever talked from one Christian to another Christian, and neither of you are excited about it? That's not what Apollos had. Apollos had 
fervent spirit. When he talked about Jesus, he talked with passion. He was passionate about Jesus. He was fervent in spirit, and he spoke and he taught accurately. But he could only talk about what he knew. He couldn't talk about what he did not know. And all he knew was the baptism of John. Now let me just say, the gospel of the baptism of John, he proclaimed boldly. Now what would that be? That John was born to parents that were too old to have a birth. Wouldn't that be part of John's testimony? That John's mom was related to this woman who supernaturally got uh, in, in, in serving with a child without a man who was his cousin six months younger. Wouldn't that be part of his testimony? And that he had a Nazarite vow, not just a nice year for 30 days, but he had a Nazarite vow from birth. No razor on the head, no razor on the face, nothing but locusts and wild honey. Would wear wild clothes and live out in the desert. And he was to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Not a Messiah, but the Messiah. And he was to give a very simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is alive. Now, how many of you say, oh, no, no, you're supposed to say at hand. But guess what the phrase at hand means? He's right here, right now. We're not talking about the Messiah's coming some 50 or 75 years or 100 years from now. When we talk about the second coming, it could be 100 years from now, correct? But what if somebody was running in front and he was to say, the, the rapture will happen in my lifetime. Now, I know a lot of people say that. But John the Baptist could say it because he was told by God to say it. And it was absolutely 100% accurate. You know, a lot of people have said, it's going to happen in my lifetime. And they have come and gone. Be careful. <clears throat> Speak what you know. And know for sure that you're speaking the truth. He proclaimed what he knew boldly, but... Priscilla and Aquila, take a look at this. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him over to their house because he was preaching an incomplete gospel. Incomplete gospel. Because all he talked about was his, Jesus' coming, maybe up to his baptism. And we don't even know if he got that far. But he did believe Jesus was the Christ. That we know. They invited him home. How do you know that they invited him home? The word here that says, and they took him aside, literally means, and they took him, they received him, and they brought him. So they didn't just take him to the back of the synagogue. They got him away from everybody. Because the one thing you would not want to do to a powerful speaker is publicly humiliate them. And so they received him, they took him home privately and explained, it literally says, and explained the way of God more accurately. Now the word for accurately means completely. That as one famous person of yesterday would say, and now for the rest of the story. Yeah. <laughs> and now for the rest of the story. So an incomplete gospel, I want to point out that an incomplete gospel is incomplete grace. Because you cannot be forgiven from your sins if you don't know you're a sinner. You, you cannot be forgiven of your sins if you don't know what God did and had to do to have your sins forgiven. If all you heard is Jesus is alive and Jesus was baptized, you can see that on Discovery Channel. That is not enough. The birth of Jesus, fabulous, amen? The baptism of Jesus, fabulous, amen? Can either of those things save you in and of themselves? And so it's incomplete. And if all you ever heard was his baptism and his birth, great stories. But if all we do as a church, or a kid's church, or, or a one, is if all we do is talk about his birth and his baptism and his miracle working, that doesn't save anybody. He's got to go to the cross. He has got to have victory over sin. It is not the gospel if all you say is, I'm okay, you're okay. It is not the gospel if you just say, God loves you. Anybody hear any of this teaching recently? It is not the gospel if it, Jesus is our friend. These are all right out of the book that's being taught by Pastor Darrell. 
How many weeks ago did you possibly teach this lesson? A few. Yeah. And so if it's been a few, you guys have all forgotten it by now. Jesus is not just our example for how we ought to live. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I follow the moral, moral, ethical teachings of Jesus. I'll tell you, that will lead a good life. You'll be a good person. Hell is filled with good people. Heaven is filled with evil people who trusted the death, burial, and resurrection. The complete gospel. Let's talk about it again. Because those who love it best have no problem hearing it again. And so the gospel is God is holy. The gospel is God hates sin. Now, it doesn't say sinners, right? God hates sin. Sin alienates us from him. God cannot be where sin is and will not be where sin is. But God is gracious. And because God is gracious, he sent his one and only son. And because he did, Jesus lived a perfect life. Who is the only one that could live perfectly in the world in which they created, but the creator themselves. And because he lived a perfect life, he could die a perfect death. He didn't die because he did anything wrong. He did not need a savior. As the writer of Hebrews would say, he is not only a prophet and our priest, but he is the sacrificial lamb. He is everything. Jesus was victorious over sin. Now, how many of us would say, no, no, wait, you need to say he was victorious over death. But what is death? Death is the penalty of what? Sin. So Jesus was not just victorious over death. He was victorious over sin. When he died on the cross and rose out of the grave, he was victorious over sin. Your sin can be completely eradicated through Christ and only through Christ. Jesus is the Savior. Now, I took the gospel and turned it around this way because I know how much we love these. And so it looks like this. God created us to be with him. Our sin separated us from God. Sin cannot be removed by human deeds. Paying the price, Jesus died and Jesus lives. Everyone who trusts in the name of the Lord. Now, the name of the Lord does not mean the historical Jesus. Because remember, even Apollos was preaching the historical Jesus. But it was not enough. Everyone who trusts in him says, I trust. It's an amen. Why did Jesus come? Because there was no other way for us to be redeemed. Bought back. Why did Jesus come? To pay the penalty for all sin. Why did Jesus come? Because he loves us. Why did Jesus come? Because God is gracious. And everyone who trusts in him, all of him, of what he did, why he did it, who he is, everyone who trusts in him will be saved. And life, eternal life, starts now. It starts here. It is not when you die. When my father took a step in a driveway and fell down into the wood pile, that was just a chassis. My father rose into heaven because there was no longer life in the chassis. Have you ever seen those cars that have been pulled over and left for dead? There's no more any life in it. At one time it was vibrant. But the, the job of that chassis was just to move people around. And the, and the job of your chassis is to get you from one place to another. But God has got a better chassis for you. I'm looking forward to that chassis. And the more this body breaks down, the more I'm looking forward to it. I am very much looking forward to it. And so eternal life, though, I be able to begin right here and right now. The church at Ephesus, how did it do? Was it a healthy church? Well, we can know by the way that they took care of Apollos. It sure had signs of a healthy church. It had signs of a healthy church. The church at Ephesus was healthy by the way in which they took Paul's society. Now let me ask you this. How is Westside Community Church doing? Are we gospel saturated? Now, let's intensify that one more level. Can we do that? How am I doing? How am I doing? Am I gospel saturated? Do I really think about not just the miracles, but I think about the death, the burial, the resurrection? Am I gospel saturated? Do I really know the gospel? 
So if somebody was to say, what is this church thing about? Well, it starts at about 8, and Pastor Ray usually goes 15 minutes long. It is what we know, just what we knew, or is what we know what he did. You see, there's a big difference. We should be inviting people to Christ, not just inviting people to church. We hope when they come, we're so gospel-saturated that they would get loved on with the good news of Jesus Christ. Do I desire to hear the gospel? Now, you know, will I desire to tell it even to myself? You know, the, these two put together means, am I reading my Bible every day, thinking about Jesus every day, talking about Jesus every day? Is it ordering, is my life order around it? Is it the main dish? Or is it the side dish? Anybody remember a thing called a Sunday? I think it's made with ice cream. Did you know originally the reason for the name was because you only had it on Sunday? It was called that because it was such a special treat that they would only make it on a day when they had plenty of time to prepare it. And so it would be prepared, and then they would give it to people on a special day. And so they said, oh, I can't wait for the Sunday. And that's how that name came about. You see, for some of us, the only time we think about Jesus is Sunday. Now, let me tell you, all you had in your spiritual diet was Sunday, you would probably be anemic. We need to have Jesus Christ every day, not just Sunday. So ask yourself as you prepare to leave today, are we as a church gospel-saturated? Am I gospel-saturated? If somebody was to squeeze me with the syrup of Jesus oozed out, or am I just a dried up lump on a plate? And I don't know about you, but there's nothing worse than a dried up lump. So what do we do? You see, when somebody comes to Christ, usually a lot of their friends say, well, they gave up. They gave up. They couldn't do it on their own. They had to have some crutch. That Christianity is a crutch. Now, think about this. I'm not giving up. When you come to Christ and you know what you're doing when you come to Christ, it is not giving up. It is yielding back everything he is. Because who gave you you? Who owns you? I am just giving back to him. I'm not giving up. I'm just rendering to someone else what literally belongs to them. Who he died for. Who he lives for. I'm not giving up. Basically, I'm just starting over. Because Jesus is the Messiah. Now when you think about that just for a second, he is the gospel. He is the good news. How am I doing? Now I don't mean critique Pastor Ray. Although it's alright to do that. I want to know how you're doing. Are you really saturated, desired, tell, ordering your life around the main dish? Or are we just happy meeling ourselves to Jesus? Let's pray. Father, as we prepare to leave and maybe go to Bible study or to go back into the world, I just pray that again we would have been encouraged and strengthened. I am sure that when Paul went through Galatia and Phrygia, that the way that he strengthened all the disciples was to tell them again the good news of Christ. But Father, I thank you for the story that an incomplete gospel can't save anyone. And a church that truly cares about lost people cannot allow incomplete gospel. So help us, Lord, to continually evaluate everything we do. And if we are not gospel-saturated in that program, in that class, we don't need to have it. We need to be developing healthy church members. Because we are completely unashamed, sold out for the gospel who is Jesus Christ. If there's
anyone here today that is just saying, I know all this, I know all this, and I'm not doing all this. And you just want me to pray for you this week that you will renew your mind by renewing the main dish of your life and putting Jesus back where he belongs on the top of my priorities rather than just somewhere intermixed when I have the moment, when I have a moment of free time. If you need me to pray for you, every head bowed, every eye closed, just go ahead and slip your hand. I'll, I'll start praying for you today. Amen. I see that. Amen. Any others? Amen. Father, for these who Say, I need help, Lord. Help them to hear not just my prayer today, but help them to experience you.